Good evening. I'd like to welcome all of our viewers on Facebook and thank you for joining us for tonight's West Sacramento Candidates Forum. I'm excited to serve as tonight's moderator. My name is Chelsea Miner. I handle public affairs for Raley's and have uh, served as the past chair of the West Sacramento Chamber of Commerce. Tonight's forum is brought to you by the West Sacramento Chamber of Commerce as a service to our community. The goal of tonight is to introduce you to the candidates and allow the voters to learn more about their positions and platforms. The chamber does not endorse candidates. To discuss the upcoming special election, we are joined remotely by Jesse Salinas, Yolo County's chief elections official. Good evening. I'm Jesse Salinas, Yolo County's ace, and welcome to the West Sacramento Special Election Forum. As you may know, the 2020 general election even with the pandemic, was extremely successful. With the help of jurisdictions, local businesses, and school districts, we were able to provide 12 voter assistance centers and 12 drop boxes countywide. Voters could visit any voter assistance center to vote. Each location was open for three days prior to election day for eight hours and from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on election day. Voters were able to check in using our new electronic poll book system. Only a few voters experienced a 15 minute wait. In fact, most wait times were under five minutes. If you're wondering how good of a turnout we had last November, of the 119,000 registered voters, over 99,000 voted for an 83% countywide turnout. For comparison, the highest presidential election turnout in the last 30 years was 77%. If you're wondering, West Sacramento's turnout was 79% last November, also surpassing the 30-year high. I'm excited to share that every registered voter will receive a vote-by-mail ballot like the last election. And we will continue using our voter assistance centers and vote by mail drop box model for this election. I want to wish the candidates the best of luck in the upcoming election and encourage all registered voters to vote on this important election. Thank you. Tonight features two candidates for the one at-large seat on the West Sacramento City Council. This seat was previously held by now Mayor, Mayor Martha Guerrero. Their order tonight was selected by random draw. I'd like to take a moment and introduce our candidates for the City of West Sacramento. First, Dr. Dante Early, and second, Dwayne Wilson. Thank you both for being here this evening. Let's start by going over the rules for tonight's forum. Let me remind you that this is a forum and not a debate. We intend to ask thoughtful questions and get thoughtful responses. We ask that you direct your questions to the audience and not to your fellow candidate. And please do not interrupt or make sounds while the other candidate is speaking. I'll adjust the order in which I ask you questions so that you each will have a chance to answer first. I'll indicate how much time is allowed per question and we'll have a timekeeper that will provide you a 30 second warning and a 15 second warning, and also a reminder that your time is wrapping up. I politely will, will uh, interrupt you if you do exceed your time. To help our voters that are watching this forum, we need to make sure that we can draw contrasts between you and the other candidate. We encourage you to be specific when answering your questions, offer clear solutions, and avoid repeating what has already been said. When necessary, I may ask you to give a brief, brief clarification of your answer for the betterment of the audience. For those of you viewing at home, we ask that you put your comments, uh, or questions I should say for the candidates in the chat. Our team will be looking for common themes and topics, and we will ask some of the community questions towards the end of the program. Those are the ground rules, let's get started. We'll begin with opening statements from each of you. You will have three minutes to introduce yourself to our online audience, provide some background about yourself, and explain why you are running for City Council. We'll begin with Dr. Dante Early. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so 
for having me. Thank you, West Sacramento neighbors and community um, for joining us. So I think it's important to acknowledge it has been almost a year since we were last on this stage. And many of the issues we were addressing as a community then, we are still facing now. And so when I said last year that I felt a call to serve, I hope you will understand that I feel even greater a call to serve now. Having two parents who dedicated their lives to the military and seeing them serve our country, you know, it rubbed off on me as a kid. And having my son at 19 and having to give up my basketball scholarship while I was in college, you know, it showed me at an early age what living your life to benefit someone else really means. I'm running for city council because my skills and my background put me in a unique position to tackle West Sacramento's pressing challenges head on. We're working our way out of a pandemic. I have extensive experience in public health. No other candidate in this race can say that. Although my title is Chief of Research and Evaluation for our state's mental health commission, I actually like to think of myself as a data detective. When I look at data, I don't see numbers. I see people, people who often go unheard, underrepresented or unrepresented altogether. I see communities that I come from. I follow data and science to find real solutions to problems faced by people in need every day. And that's what I wanna do as your city council member. I'll follow the data and most importantly, I will listen to our community to find solutions that benefit everyone in West Sac. I've been volunteering and advocating for community and West Sac since I moved here over a decade ago. I come to this table as a public and mental health advocate and leader, as an African-American woman who has worked on racial and gender equity policies at the state level. I'm here as a youth coach who likes to mentor young athletes. I'm here as a Girl Scout troop leader who loves cultivating curiosity and interest in our West Sac girls. I'm here as an Elkhorn Village PTA mom who wants the best not only for my child, but for all of the kids here in West Sacramento. West Sacramento is my home. It's my family's home and I love our city. I think my experience and background are what our community can use in a city council member right now. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Dwayne Wilson. Hi. Good evening, West Sacramento. My name is Dwayne Wilson and uh, I'm a small business owner living in the city. I've been living here since 2002 uh, when I moved uh, to this area. And I think that over the last 30 years or so of my experience running companies, uh, creating startups, mentoring new entrepreneurs, I think that those kinds of things will play well into helping our town and our city grow and recover from the pandemic that we've been in. So as a business community and a general community, I think that we need to make sure that our small businesses are thriving, that the people that work for those small businesses have jobs and continue training, and that we build out the city's infrastructure so that we can attract new businesses and new residents and the new amenities that we all want as we start to open back up. Uh, hopefully we can stay back open but if not, we're resilient and we can work around that too. With the help of local government and state and federal government, hopefully none of our small businesses and large businesses will go out of business and hopefully our employees will stay employed and safe. So I have run my business Delta Hand Pies for over a year now. We started as a COVID project and the idea was to promote local farmers and growers to feature their products in our food, to then give back to the community um, through the Yellow Food Bank, the River City Food Bank. Uh, currently, we're doing a, a fundraiser for the Cortland Pear Fair, which was unable to happen again this year. So even though I'm a, a business owner and a capitalist, I, I'm also more on the social side, and I like to um, 
I like to work on projects that give back to our community. So for the last 10 years or so, I've been working quietly on various projects in our city, mostly around parks and playgrounds. I started with a group called um, Bridgeway Play when it first started. Uh, it became Wessack Play, and we built uh, shade structures for play playgrounds all over the city, and I'm very proud of all of that work. Um, my experience working with the city and doing that, hosting dinners and events throughout the city, uh, really gave me a good idea about how the city runs and how we function. And I'm really looking forward to using all of my experience uh, on boards, running companies, to help our city grow and, and be the best that it can be. And so thank you very much, and um, I'm happy to be here this evening. Great, wonderful to have you, thank you. So I'm gonna kick it back to you for our first question. People are often surprised to learn that the role of the West Sacramento mayor and council members is a part-time commitment. Our elected leaders have full-time jobs, minimal uh, city salary, and no designated staff. I shouldn't say, I should admit, right, we have plenty of city staff, but not designated to your individual role. How do you plan to handle the added workload of public office? So, um, I, I have a lot of boards that I'm on currently, and I have a lot of free time as a business owner. So I can set my own schedule, I can go places during the day, I can meet with constituents and, and business owners um, at, at my leisure. And so I think that uh, this is another commitment that I'm willing to take on, even though it's essentially unpaid, <laughs> as we all know. Um, but I think that uh, I won't have a problem fulfilling any of those roles. Great. I apologize, I didn't to give you a warning that was a two minute answer plenty of time but oh. for for you dante that's a two minute question again how are you prepared to handle the added uh, workload uh, that public office will bring you can i have his time no <laughs> <laughs> two minutes um so so to be frank when when i when i decided um to to what I say, answer the call to serve um, and to, to step up. And when I decided to run, you know, I, I really thought hard about the the time commitment. And for me, I this is a value for me. I felt last year in 2020 a real understanding, more than ever, how important our local government is. Your local government is where community meets government. It's when you think about what I, again, public health, social determinants of health, where you live, work, and play, your local government has a lot to do with that. And so when I think about the fact that I am taking away time from my family, from my work, um, from some of the other things I enjoy doing, it's important to me because I felt the call to serve. I want to help. This is an extension of a lot of the work that I already do. For seven years, I was chair of our aging commission here in West Sacramento. I am currently a first five uh, Yolo County commissioner. I've also sat on commissions and boards and I enjoy Girl Scouts and also uh, coaching. But for me, the commitment runs deep. And so when you say, hey, how are you gonna make the time? I too have the privilege of, of having a career in which I can make time for something like this, but it really is a privilege. And that probably is a conversation for another day, but talking about real access to our local government and who really can have a seat at the table. Great, thank you. Back to you for the next question. I'm ready. It's a bit of a ping pong here. This is a complex question and kind of three parts, so bear with me. West Sacramento currently has the lowest vaccination rates in all of Yolo County. While vaccination education and administration is primarily a county responsibility, what is your plan to increase vaccination rates in our city? Specifically, how would you educate citizens of West Sacramento on the safety and the availability of the COVID-19 vaccine? And the last question, how would you ensure that all citizens know when and where they, and how they can be vaccinated? I'm writing them all down. Okay. So we have vaccination rates as typically a county service. What is how your plan? How would you help? How would you educate? Yep. And then how do you ensure that your citizens know about those resources and where to get a vaccine? 
We'll give you three minutes for this question. Um, let's start with just minimum education just for our, for our viewers. So um, West Sacramento's vaccination rate is about 48% the last time I checked, um, which is slightly lower than Woodlands um, in Yolo County. So we do have the lowest vaccination rates. When you hear from our public health officer um, for Yolo County, one of the things they note is that we have a large community um, that speaks different languages, both Russian and Spanish. And one of the issues that they have called out is that there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so I think to myself, when you talk about um, vaccination rates and how are we going to increase them, I think first, as you, I think, indicated, is working with our county. A lot of the times you have seen in West Sacramento that things that would normally be considered county services, West Sacramento takes on, whether that be childcare, whether that be workforce development or housing. We dive in 100% and roll up our sleeves. And I think of this, quite honestly, as nothing different. This is something that is going to take all of us working together real teamwork. I think it's why I'm so proud to be endorsed by our county supervisor, Oscar Villegas. Those partnerships are going to be invaluable when we are working as a city with our county. And so you said, what's the plan on educating? Well, like I said, our public health officer has indicated that they are making a hard push in our city specifically to make sure to combat misinformation in other languages. That's one. Safety and availability. One of the things that I um, think is really important is that it's not just about um, availability. Even though we have a lot of availability, quite honestly, within our county to come here in West Sacramento, we have mobile units that will come right to your house because one of the things we learned early on was that people had transportation issues or they had childcare issues in which they couldn't go to the vaccination sites themselves. As a Yolo County First Five Commissioner, I'm proud to say that I was part of vaccinating 500 providers in Yolo County, which is so important when you think of childcare being one of the things that our first responders and other city staff that are continuing to run our city while we were isolating in place needed. And so when I think of availability, we have availability. It's not that we no longer have vaccines. They're, they're there and there's mobile units that will come to you. And so I think at this point, some of our hardest to vaccinate populations and communities, it's a matter of trust. It's a matter of having a health fair event in which you have opportunities for childcare, for folks to come together, not going there specifically for the vaccine, but going there to enjoy each other where other people who are vaccinated are, and then having vaccines available, having information available. That's one of the things we just did on our school give back, and I will stop right there. I'm going to give you an extra 30 seconds, though, because okay. I want to make sure that we get at that third question and you'll have an additional 30 seconds as well. OK. How do you ensure that all citizens know when, where and how they can be vaccinated? It's not just about social media. Um, it's very tempting for us um, to rely heavily on social media. And I think that's a lot of um, what both our county and potentially our city has done as well. It's actually about engaging with the community, finding cultural liaisons, whether that be within your church, whether that be within your schools, trusted sources of information to partner with in order to get into vulnerable communities that have had misinformation put in those communities. How do you ensure that even if you don't trust government, you trust this source? Great, thank you. Do you need me to repeat the question? No, thank you. Great, you've got three minutes and 30 seconds. Great. So. Currently, the 95695 zip code in West Sac, I believe, has the lowest vaccination rates as opposed to the one that we're currently in, which is doing a decent job of getting vaccines out. Those communities, mostly the Muslim, Sikh, Russian, Latin communities that exist on the north side, we need to work with them and the community leaders to make sure that they understand that the vaccine is safe and healthy and effective and that it will lower the spread of disease in their communities as well as the general population. So by talking to community leaders, uh, going to events and making sure that people in the community who 
already buy into the idea that the vaccines are safe are the ones doing the speaking, not the government doing the speaking. I think it's important to find community leaders throughout our city that can take on these, these tasks for their you know, micro communities and, and make sure that everyone gets safe vaccines. So Martha, Mayor Guerrero is um, holding a, uh, an event on 814 at the uh, Broderick boat ramp to encourage folks to come out and get a vaccine. There'll be a barbecue party and uh, life vest and water safety training and the YOLO office, emergency services will also be there uh, administering vaccines. So I think, you know, doing events out in the community, showing people that it's safe and, and talking to them are really the best ways to go about um, getting a higher rate of vaccination. Um, as for the when, why question, um, I think that it's really important to just go knock on people's doors and, and have a conversation with them and to include community members from, from those areas to come with you, uh, to vouch for, for the you. And so we've been working on a group of uh, folks that we can go out and door knock with over the next few weeks uh, to get people to come to this event, uh, to hang out and also get their shot. And uh, I, th I think that's about it. Great. So back to you sticking with our COVID theme here. Um, and you brought up a lot of this in your introductory comments, thinking a, a little bit more on the business side. So as the Delta variant uh, continues to increase our COVID-19 exposure, we're also seeing new mandates like masks coming back. And we've heard from some of our businesses that they're afraid of a second shutdown or not having enough business and foot traffic to sustain and survive. What is your plan as you think about approaching this role come September 15th, um, but also thinking ahead on how might you re help to rebuild West Sacramento's post-pandemic economy? Right. I think that we need help from every level of our government at this point. You know, we need federal monies to, to come into the state. We need the state to recognize our predicament in our particular area and region and help us uh, come up with grants and loan programs and other kinds of ways that we can uh, fill in from the void. And so if it comes down to remasking and, and maybe even stay at home orders again, uh, I think that our business community is strong and that over the last year, we've taught people to uh, order out and to do curbside pickup and businesses have adapted. And, and those that haven't, I think it's the responsibility of the city to go off and help them learn the rules, help them figure out what the problem is and, and possible solutions, and then to change the, the rules around the way the city operates to enable them to best operate their businesses in this time. The way we've done things in the past doesn't dictate the way we do things in the future. Changes and market conditions happen. And so we have to be adaptive and resilient to those things. And so as a city, if it means opening up the streets and blocking off uh, automotive traffic so that people can have outside dining, then, then we need to do that. And so I think there's an, a number of ways that we can go about uh, helping our business community, uh, just locally, but also with, with the state's help. Great, thank you. Dante, question over to you about the economy, some of the fears that businesses are having in both the short term, but also the post-pandemic economy. How long do I have? Two minutes. Okay, thank apologize. You. So I'm actually very scared for our small business community as well and the business community overall. When I look at the data and I, I look at where we're trending, a lot seems similar to last year. And I, I have to wonder what can we do better? A few weeks ago, I um, went to a community engagement event that our Yolo County threw at our local library. And we came together to discuss what does our community need. Yolo County is getting $42.8 million in COVID relief funding. West Sacramento, I think, is slated to get about $11.7 And so we came together to talk about, all right, 
Let's learn from the past. We just went through this. How do we come out better? How do we invest in helping our business community? And so for me, I'm, I'm a big learner. I'm a big gatherer of information. And so I've been talking, right? I've been talking to, to small businesses, but I've also been talking to former leaders about how what Sacramento used to engage with some of our businesses and what were some of the things they used to do. And one of the things in talking to one of our, our former city council member, Wes Spears, he said, you know what we used to do? We used to actually go to small businesses and, and actually have discussions about what do you need right now? What are the things that you need in your workforce? I feel like this would be the same approach that we'd want to take. This is an opportunity, not only to help our small businesses, but also to help our community in ensuring that there are workforce that can support some of the actual additional demands that our small businesses are having. And so that's one of the things I would do. How do we better invest this money, this one-time money that we're being infused with? Let's actually talk to the community. Dante, this is going to be back to you. You'll have two minutes to answer the next question. You're running for a special election seat that has a term ending in 2022. Given that this is a short-term appointment, what is the one thing you hope to accomplish between now and the end of your term? Just one? Just one. <laughs> Just one. I think that there are actually a lot of opportunities. Um, both within our uh, COVID dollars that we're getting um, to support small businesses, both within opportunities to increase vaccination rates within our community, and also in partnering to support our children and youth who also have been dealing with a community trauma. We have all just been through a community trauma, all of us. I really want that to sink in. As we've been isolating in place, so many of us are coming out of this with anxiety, with feeling the pressure for various reasons. And so I think there is an opportunity here to think about how do we better support our families and our youth through services and through collaborations with our schools. We have one-time funding that we need to partner both with the county and with organizations within our city. Thank you. Thank you. Dwayne, question over to you around what's the one thing you want to accomplish before the end of your term? Um, I think that the COVID recovery fund is probably the most important thing in the next year to take care of. And that addresses a few different areas in our city homelessness for one um getting more people off the street more jobs and more educational programs for our, our kids so i think that we can have mentorship and stewardship programs uh for our children and you know from kindergarten up and that will help bring up a higher quality of education for us and so we have this this pile of funding coming in that that we can do that with and I think those are the, the primary objectives, is to make sure that people are safe, make sure that people are employed and homed and back to work as, as best we can. Great. Next question is going to be to you. It's a two-part. We prepared one question, and then we're actually going to expand it with one that came from our Facebook community. As America undergoes a democratic shift amidst racial inequalities, in the path to prosperity, how will you promote and advance inclusive economic development in the city of West Sacramento? And from our audience, how do you ensure that the gap doesn't get better, excuse me, better, bigger, excuse me, how do we ensure the gap doesn't get bigger between the have and have nots? Yeah, that's a great question. So, for the last four years, I, I worked on a, a nonprofit called Founder Academy. And that program took 30-ish CEOs from the community, paired them with young entrepreneurs who wanted to start new businesses, and helped them navigate the processes of legal formation, tax, accounting, all those basic things that one has to do, bookkeeping, but also marketing and product development and design and how you go about talking to customers to figure out what product you want to make. 
And so we've been running that program for about three, three and a half years now, uh, although last year it didn't do much of anything uh, because it was designed around in-person meetings, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so I think that you know we can do similar kinds of public-private partnerships with other groups who are working on uh, building up uh, low-income or disadvantaged people who want to start businesses. So last year I worked with uh, Alchemist Kitchen in Sacramento, uh, working on uh, food startup programs, uh, going through that program myself, uh, talking with them about things that can be done in the community. Um, I think that the gap will get bigger as long as access to capital and funding and space and a network remain low for people who aren't from Stanford or you know, Yale. And so I think that as a city, we can do a lot to bring in mentors and build up uh, programs to, to help people start businesses properly, make sure that the licensing and everything is taken care of as smoothly as possible, especially in the pandemic era and then get them launched and get them running um, safely. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we could go about uh, attacking those problems. But I think for my past history, you know, working in this mentorship role, I think is probably one of the better roles to do. As a follow-up to that, what do you have, what would you say for somebody who maybe doesn't want to start their own business, but wants economic prosperity? How might you support them in your role? Right. So. You know, part of starting a business is that you hire employees and you take care of them. And so uh, I think that we should have job training and job programs uh, for finding jobs with small businesses. Many, many are struggling to find employees. And so many people need to be directed to where those opportunities are and make sure that they're right sized, make sure that they're, they're properly addressed from the employer's perspective and also the employee's perspective. And so I think that, you know, not, not everyone is cut out to start a business. It's a completely separate thing in the universe for most people. Um, but we, we need to make sure that the employees are taken care of as well and that anybody who wants to work can do so. Great. Thank you. So you'll have three minutes back at you, right, discussing a little bit about some of the inequalities and how do we create inclusive economic development and ensure that the gap doesn't get bigger. Over to you, Dante. I'm going to touch on a couple of things. Um, so one of the things that we, we actually saw in COVID, Chelsea, was that the gap did get bigger, right? It got bigger. Um, the division between the, the have and have nots actually grew, largely for communities of color, not making as much as the majority community in our state and in our country do. So when I think about inclusive equity and development, I, I think about our small businesses, just to start with. Many small businesses, in fact, a large portion of small businesses are owned by minority owners. And so when we talk about supporting small businesses, we're actually talking about supporting largely minority communities you're talking about generational wealth being passed from one to the other, which is huge. That is a huge opportunity when we talk about how do we better support our small businesses. When we talk about economic disparity, I, I have to admit, I, I think to myself, this is not something that a city in and of itself, city council member or your, your local leadership can solve all by themselves. This is a partnership in which we work not only with our county, but with our state about what breaking down structural and institutional racism really looks like in regards to our hiring practices and who really has access to jobs. One of the things that I did when I worked at CDCR for a couple of years is I led a racial equity training program, 15 executives, in which we said, okay, we're going to look, really dig in deep on what racial and gender equity looks like within our organization, 65,000 employees. Now you would think, because the way that the state works, that hiring policies and practices are supposed to be fair across the board. But I'm a data scientist, and so I go less on assumptions and more on what does the data tell me? 
And one of the things that the data said, not only quite honestly for corrections, but across our state and policies in which we are supposed to be the same, is that there were vast disparities, not only in hiring who were in management positions, but also in pay, gender, and race. Same, same positions. Women of color making less money. It's not supposed to be that way. And so when you ask me about economic disparities, I think to myself, this is a problem that we absolutely should be tackling, both at the local level, but at the state level as well, and partnering to break down what structural and institutional racism looks like. Thank you. We're gonna kick this next one back to you. Again, it will be a partially prepared question and then with some enhancement from our Facebook audience. Given the important role that police and fire play in keeping our communities safe, how do you propose to fund these services? Do you support increasing wages to attract and retain officers and firefighters? And then the follow-up, so we'll give you three minutes for this one since it's so complex. What is your position on any police officers reform? And if you believe that there needs to be, what specific reforms might you propose? First part was, what do I how think do about raises? Fund, funds. How do you okay. propose just in general to fund these yeah. services that are very important? As a follow-up, would you support increasing their wages to attack, or attack, attract and retain? Don't want to attack them. Ag and then again, what's, what's your position on police officer reform? Okay, um, first part. Um, so hopefully we've been paying attention to our local budget as well as our state budget. Um, but more importantly, locally. Um, we actually did pretty well last year. Um, in regards to the uh, funding that we had come in and our general fund both uh, here that we have locally and both on some of our measures. The thing is, I'm a data person. And so when I think about projections and trends and I see anything move up at one point in time, I want to see a couple of point data points in which I can rely that that is what our future is going to look like. So to answer your question, because I think that's what you're looking for. First, how would you fund these services? We're doing a good job of funding these services now. So that's at a very basic level. Um, there are opportunities uh, potentially within some of our measures that we could allocate and regulations do allow for us to allocate some of those funding um, to potentially have additional going to our public safety. But I think before we would do that, we would want to see what our budget looks like moving forward. I think that as a community, as we are potentially going into a high uptick, uptick in trends of COVID, I think we have to be very, very careful on what we do with our budget. We have to have a sustainable budget in which we are not over leveraging ourselves, And I just think that is so critical and so key. We've been very fortunate that our leadership here in West Sacramento has kept us in the black, right? Has made sure that our budget remains balanced. And I think we need to ensure that we do that moving forward. To your other, um, you called it police reform. I call it actually evolving with our community. As our community grows, not only does our public safety need to respond to that growth and to those changes in our community, all of our city services need to be responsive to changes that we have in our community. One of the things that I worked on last year that I'm very, very proud of in working with Police Chief Strange, as well as others on President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative here in West Sac, was how do we rethink community policing? I'm very proud that we prioritized mental health within our police department, and that we also went back behind there and began discussing that the positions that we allocated to responding to mental health crises, people who are having mental health crises breaks, that those positions were then going to be re-put back into the budget so that we had now this mental health responding unit as well as appropriate funding and services within our sworn police officers as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Back to you, Duane. On the topic of police and fire, how are we gonna fund these services? Do you support increasing wages to attract and retain our officers and firefighters? And do you believe that there needs to be reform for our police officers 
And if so, what might that look like? Yeah, so I think at this point, public safety is a huge concern for our city. Crime is up about 30%. We have more fires, more fires around us. So police and fire and EMTs with COVID are stretched thin. We have money, measure in money, for instance, that could be used. And we have other income streams for the city that are coming down the pipe. So I don't know if we necessarily need to raise taxes or anything like that, but there are funding mechanisms in place to continue that on. But more so from what I hear, from, more so than raises, it's people. So we need more staff in the police and fire departments and the EMTs. They're stretched pretty thin. Right now, I think people would be surprised to learn that, you know, only six to eight police officers are out in our entire city at any given point in time. Um, I was on a ride along for the last two and a half hours today uh, with our police department and, and having conversations with uh, many of the officers. Uh, many of them who said that, yes, even though pay is low in West Sacramento relative to other districts, that they enjoy serving here and they want to be part of the community. And so I think we need to find a way to get more folks in and more equipment with new housing going in. The fire department is going to be stretched to provide the kinds of services that we need. Uh, police is bordering on the same. And so we need to focus more on, you know, our retention is okay, but we've lost like seven people in the last year or so. And so I really like the community policing effort. Um, they do as well. And I think that we need to continue that as more. We need to get Yolo County in providing more of the services that they're supposed to be providing for us. And we also need to increase the number of officers or out on patrol and out in the community talking to people. Um, somebody, uh, an officer told me today that whenever they meet someone in the city, it's, it's potentially the worst day that person has ever had in their entire lives. And so they are going out as a representative of the city and as of the community to meet those folks on a really, really bad day. And so they need the support and services to continue to do that good work with us. Great, thank you. Back to you for the next question. You'll have two minutes. There's a, a well-known high traffic area from essentially the freeway through industrial and harbor to Southport. Uh, this area, of course, is known to have lack of road maintenance and constant congestion. How will you improve road quality and make this area safer for drivers? Two minutes. So I think that our city suffers from infrastructure fatigue um, and lack of it. We have awesome access points between the rivers, the canal, the highways on either side of us. And in order to get more businesses to come and get people around the city more efficiently, we need to focus on rebuilding our infrastructure. Now is a good time to do that. Um, I think specifically, people are being very impatient out in the universe right now. Everybody is uh, just rushing from one place to another. And so I hope that, you know, maybe we can have some conversations about uh, traffic calming and slowing things down and making sure that we are a respectful community uh, to one another and, and not uh, driving 90 miles an hour everywhere. <laughs> Great, thank you. Question over to you around traffic from Southport to industrial to the highway. Um, I think it's important because you also touched on, on the roads, right? And uh, the maintenance of the roads, I think you said in the mm -hmm. question. I wanna make sure I don't miss anything this time. Um, what I think is interesting is probably one of the biggest um, infrastructure, if you could think of it that way, projects that we've done over the past few years was um, $20 million worth of putting in infrastructure in our Washington um, district. I was really surprised about this. It's like a little known fact, right? Because it's, it's underneath us. <laughs> and they also, when they did that, they also put in bike lanes. Um, and you, anywhere where you see those, the, the green new bike lanes, I know we've all seen them here in West Sac, that was part of that project. What you will also see 
coming up this year, hopefully by the end of the year, I think that's when it's slated to happen, is that all of West Cap will be pulled up. Also little known, little known story, um, West Capitol used to be um, a highway, right? It was like if you have kids, cars, Radiator Springs, in which it had you know six lanes and it was a bustling right area in town. And what we've seen over the years, um, when 50 went in and 80 went in, um, that that very long traveled road um, took a beating, right? Um, I will often say that when I when I drive down West Cap, that it can be very difficult because there's lots of lots of potholes. And I had one individual that I talked to in a coffee shop say, "If you add one more layer of tar to West Cap, it is going to be like a mountain." That was Renee. See, I was listening. Um, and so when, when you talk about um, infrastructure, I actually do think we are investing in our infrastructure. Like I said, we have projects going right now and have over the past few years. Um, but I think it's a matter of making sure that people see that and understand that our staff are working on that and also understand the priority list. I get questions about this all the time. You know, I got my street and there exactly. is something that, that needs to be worked on. And so Time's I did, up. gotcha. Thank you. If you want to tack it on to this, the end of this question, or beginning of this question, you are more than welcome. You'll have it. two minutes for this one. This actually came from our Facebook audience. Okay. How do we balance growth in our city so that the most vulnerable aren't impacted by gentrification? First of all, I love this question. Thank you, Facebook. Um, so very, very quickly, because I, I actually think it goes together. Um, I have talked to our city manager and actually former city managers about the investment that happens in our infrastructure and the measures that we have um, in which it is an equity um, investment in different parts of our community. That was something that voters decided that that was something they wanted to see. Um, part of that project that I talked about, that $20 million that was spent in the Washington district, was to allow for more development in those areas, so in Washington district. And so step one is allowing for it not to be more costly to build in certain parts of our city that haven't been touched in decades, quite honestly, right? It shouldn't cost more to build a house or to build a small business and come in and, and put in pipes and wiring and all of those things because of the infrastructure of that area. And so when you ask me the question of how do we ensure not having gentrification, one is ensuring that we can develop there in the first place, right? But two is ensuring that we're actually working with the community and supporting them and having home ownership and having programs that allow for them to stay in the community that they want to live in. And so it's not a matter of allowing for developers to come in and build. It's a matter of how do we start with the community that is there, work with them to see what do you want to, to have built here, and then partnering, not just coming in and colonizing. Great, thank you. Dwayne, over to you, two minutes. Sure, so I think that Getting people into homes is one of the largest wealth creation tools for, for any generation. And so I think the more people we can get into those homes and the kinds of homes that they want to live in in our community, the better off we'll all be. So that could be low income housing, that could be low to middle income housing, it could be high density residential with retail underneath, and it can be large houses with golf courses as well. We have enough land to, to do a lot of those things and to fix our policy to make it such that it doesn't cost $400,000 for a starter home, because most people can't afford that. And so we want to have a city that supports all of our different interests, and we want to have a place that supports all of the different income levels of our residents. So I think that, you know, the the federal housing money, the, the state money that's coming in, we have a lot of financial support pouring into the city, especially now, to go off and do some of those projects. And um, I think now is a, a great time to do it. So I think that's my answer. Great, thank you. 
Dwayne, this woman will go back to you for two minutes. There's been a lot of recent discussion about changing the structure of the city council in West Sacramento, specifically moving from at one at-large mayor seat and four at-large council member seats to a by-district election, where the city is divided into geographic districts. Question for you, do you support or oppose this proposal and why? So I absolutely support district elections. Um, for our local Democratic club, I just sent in a referendum to say that we as a club would support district elections. I think that there is, in many, many places, an equity, an age, a race, a gap that exists in at-large elections, and that by going to districts, we can have a much more focused group of people who are uh, in tune with their particular community of interest and coming back to the city. And I think that we'll get a much better representative uh, representation of our population by, by doing so. Um, I think that, you know, the mayor position should probably always be at large because that person represents our city on a whole level uh, and that district elections should happen uh, for council members. And if that means increasing the number of council members, then that's what it means. We'll have to figure that out so that it's equitable for everyone. As a follow-up to that, I think you bring up an interesting point. You mentioned that there's a gap that may currently exist um, because of the at-large seat. Do you want to elaborate on what that looks like? Well, I think that <clears throat> I think that council has traditionally been entirely from mostly one neighborhood, which is the neighborhood that Dante and I live in as well. And so I think that people in other neighborhoods feel that uh, it's too expensive and too time-consuming and that they don't have the support to run. And so I think that opening up to district elections will allow them to jump into the race and sh share their vision without having to spend a huge amount of money and time to, to do so. Um, I also think that we should eliminate campaign funding and just make it a flat fee for everybody just to make it more level. But that's a personal opinion. Great. Thank you. So question's over to you. Do you support or oppose the proposal in theory, it's not on the table yeah. for at-large, or to move from an at-large city council to a by-district council. Um, so I'll start with, yes, I support, in theory, but also in practice, um, a district election and having districts here in West Sacramento. Um, but I wanna make sure that we're on the same page about what gentrification is and how something actually like having district elections would support ensuring that we wouldn't have something like that, okay? And so when we talk about gentrification, we are talking about coming in and taking over communities largely that have been poor and communities of color, and those being taken over by people who have more means and um, more opportunities to revitalize those communities, okay? just to make sure we're on, on the same page about that. And so when I think about district elections, I think about um, ensuring that all parts of our city feel like they have full representation. And so we have our census data that is going to be coming in soon. And so one of the things that I'm a big proponent of is not drawing district seats to keep your seat of the people who are in those elected positions, right? So we are all here as city elected officials to ensure that we are fully representing West Sacramento and West Sacramento residents. And so I think it's so important that when we're talking about going to districts, that those districts fully represent our community, both socioeconomically as well as racial and ethnically. It costs just out the door $1,200 to $3,200 just to put your name on the ballot here. And so when I hear not only the opportunity to be able to step up and run, you also have to have the privilege and the luxury to have that money to put up front. Time's up. I'm sorry. I got to okay. cut you off. I'm, I am going to ask you a follow-up question as well. Yeah. And Dwayne, if you want to answer this question, you're more than welcome um, to make sure that we're, we're fair here. 
you talk about uh, making sure that these election seats are not captured by individual people that are in current seats, but then you also talk about the restriction of the funding challenge. How would you propose to get more people maybe in those areas that that would be a disadvantage to them that they couldn't make the money to even get on the ballot um, to actually move forward and represent their city? So I'll very quickly answer that question. Yeah, we'll give 30 seconds for that. Okay. All right. Um, it's not just a matter of getting on the ballot. It's also a matter of having the luxury to leave your job, um, which may not give you time to serve. Um, so it, it, it is a whole process of not just creating seats that people have access to, which is step one. It's also creating a process in which the people that are serving can actually come and serve their community, which means they need to actually have funding, support in some way to be able to take away from their job, right? Communities that normally are lower income. It is a luxury to be Time's able to have again. this time to serve. Thank you. Dwayne, did you want to add something to that? Um, sure, I'll just say that uh, I think it's important that we reform our policies to allow anybody who wants to run to run. I think that's been the key thing that I've noticed from many people who have complained about this particular issue. And I think that we can change the rules to allow all of that to happen in a really equitable way. Um, also been working with time's up never mind sorry all right dante questions back to you for two minutes as yolo county considers small amendments to their ordinance for designating unincorporated agricultural areas what is your position on retail cannabis and or warehouse growth facilities in the city of west sacramento so um well, there's a couple of thoughts on this. Uh, one, in regards to the warehouse growth, uh, we have um, growers here in West Sacramento. And so um, that's something that we're already doing and I'm in support of that. I think that we haven't actually gotten as much tax revenue as we thought we were going to get um, from growers, but I think that we are still on that pathway. Um, I think when I think about dispensaries, that if you are of legal age, it is legal here. And so for me, the idea that we have potential tax dollars leaving our city to go access services that we could provide here and businesses that we could have here, um, I think that we are missing out on something. And so I'm, I'm also in support of exploring how do we have dispensaries here in West Sacramento, um, because I don't think we have any right now. Um, I, as long as I have my two minutes, I'm going to use them. <laughs> I also think there's an opportunity here. I will go back to the equity that you talked about and the inclusion that you talked about. For years, generations, the war on drugs has targeted and disproportionately impacted communities of color. And there are funding streams and training programs for minority-owned businesses to have dispensaries. And so when we talk about equity and how could possibly the city do something like this, this is one opportunity that I think we shouldn't miss out on. Great. Thank you. Two minutes over to you, Dwayne. What is your position on retail cannabis and or warehouse growing facilities in the city? Uh, I think we need to increase the number of uh, warehouse growth facilities. Uh, and we also need to add retail cannabis to the mixture of our business community. So currently, there may be no retail communities, in, I mean, re retail centers in West Sacramento, but there is plenty of delivery options available and people are spending their tax dollars in Sacramento and Davis and Dixon and they're not spending them here. So it is true that I think the tax revenue wasn't that in great from the, the growers, but the growers bear the biggest brunt of the fees and, and rules um, and so their margins are slim. So retail would allow us to uh, grow our tax base and have uh, yet another business, uh, another amenity in our city that is it's legal and, and people are doing it anyway. So they might as well shop at the Apple store of cannabis down by Target and not somewhere else. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the things that we could do with that uh, added tax revenue from another three or four um, retail locations would be to use that money to build a pool and uh, playgrounds over in the north side of town where uh, that community has suffered greatly through uh, 
the war on drugs, but then also through not uh, our focus on not developing out that area. And so I think that we can use some of the money there to go off and uh, fund some new services for, for that side of town and also bring in some business owners who have done this before. Uh, the equity piece is really important, but many of the pieces, uh, people who get the equity grants uh, end up failing as a business because they are, aren't understanding the, the required legislation and rules about them. And so we need to have partners that come in and work with folks like that to, to get licenses. Perfect timing, impressive. <laughs> all right, team, great work. That concludes all of our questions, but we are not yet at the end of our program. I wanna make sure that we give you guys time for your closing statements. You'll have two minutes to make your closing comments. The order in which this was decided was based on our random draw and the selection from Dwayne. So with that, Dante, we'll start with you. So I am honored to ask for your vote for city council. West Sacramento is my home. I love our innovation and I love our small town feel. As the child of two service members, West Sacramento is actually the longest place I have ever lived in my entire life. This is truly my home. We may not always agree on everything, but overwhelmingly in West Sacramento, West Sacramento neighbors uplift neighbors. Our diversity is the centerpiece of our shared culture. I wanna be your city council member because I think I can help our families, our small businesses, and all of us here in West Sacramento to have more opportunities to succeed. We have to protect more people from COVID and save lives. We also need to support our small businesses who cannot afford another shutdown. And we need to make sure that those who have fallen through the cracks are treated as the neighbors they are. We can do all of this if we set aside our differences because we really are stronger together. We have a unique opportunity right now. Our county was given $42.8 million of one-time resources to help us recover from COVID. We need to ensure we invest our, in our community. We have to aid those who have been hit the hardest by COVID, protect what we have moving forward, and make wise choices that allow our city to come back even stronger. As your city council representative, I promise to engage with you. I promise to use my experience, intuition, and relationship building skills to make the best possible decisions about every dollar our city spends. The future of our city is on the ballot right now. I believe that I'm the best candidate and I'm asking for your support. Thank you, Dante. We'll close with you, Dwayne. So thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to come here tonight and speak with you and, and to West Sac, even though I can't see you. It's a little peculiar. Um, I have been interested in serving for a long time and I'm, I'm extremely excited to, to be able to, to run again. Um, I think that our city can be a lot of great things and that as a community, as diverse as we are, we can come together and build a really awesome West Sacramento. So I think that, you know, we still need to focus on some of the basic things like infrastructure and jobs and public safety and health and things like that. But we can also grow. I think that we need to be looking at our growth as a mechanism to attract new businesses and new people to come to our community over all of the other communities in which they get to choose. Um, I think that with a minimal effort, we can start to close some of those gaps and, and do some of those things together. So I think that beyond just that and, and job creation, that we have a really good opportunity to change our schools and to upgrade them so that our kids are getting the best possible education that they can get. And I think that we need to have more programs in place for our elderly populations and, and, and make sure that no one is, is left behind in that regard as well. So I'm honored to come here this evening and speak with you. And I ask humbly for your support and to earn your vote for City Council of West Sacramento. Great, thank you. 
This brings our candidates forum to a close. I wanna thank you both for spending time with the small amount of us in the room and to Dwayne's point, the rest of our community that's watching um, online. I also wanna thank our viewers for your engagement tonight um, and for your thoughtful questions. Thank you to the Center for Spiritual Awareness for allowing us to use this fantastic space. A recording of this forum will be available online at the West Sacramento Chamber of Commerce website and YouTube channel. For those of you online, I encourage you to vote on September 14th. The deadline to register is August 30th, and you can sign up online at registertovote.ca.gov. This forum was a presentation by the West Sacramento Chamber of Commerce as a community service to our residents to hear directly from the candidates. On behalf of the West Sacramento Chamber of Commerce, I wish you all a good evening. Thanks for tuning in.